Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, last time we had to cut short. Um, what am I doing? I wanted to make sure that I had everything looked over at least before diving into some of the more stigmatized portions of this lecture. So we're just going to immediately get started. Um, last time we left off talking about, what was it, antidepressants. So just as like a quick recap of this, we talked about um, typical versus atypical antidepressants and how typical antidepressants include things like SSRIs and usually will have a pretty straightforward action on serotonin reuptake inhibition. And then atypical antidepressants are often um, more involved in other, er, other neurotransmitter systems. So not just serotonin reuptake inhibition, but maybe also norepinephrine agonists, et cetera, um, or agonists, reuptake inhibitors, whatever you want. So a really prominent example of that would be bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, or trazodone, or metazapine. Um, any of those are atypical antidepressants, and they're often used off-label for other things, or they're prescribed for like variations on similar issues. Um, some atypical antidepressants are more popular for anxiety disorders, for instance, Wellbutrin is often prescribed, I think, for anxiety, um, and then things like trazodone are usually prescribed for like insomnia. So. That was where we left off. Now today, moving into antipsychotics. So antipsychotics are generally prescribed, as you might expect, to treat psychotic disorders. Um, the word antipsychotic has been uh, pretty stigmatizingly used in the past. So what I wanna be very mindful of here is noting again that we wanna destigmatize the experience of psychosis. Psychosis is more prominent than people think. Um, I don't remember the exact statistic. I think that it's like a, at least a couple percent of, of people will experience a psychotic episode for some reason at some point in their lives. It's fairly common um, and it doesn't necessarily have a disorder attached to it. Psychosis is a symptom, not a disease. Please don't call someone psychotic. That's super not cool. You don't know what the people around you have been through in their lives. Psychosis is not a sign of mental weakness, you know. So uh, yeah, Wellbutrin for ADHD. Oh, interesting. I did not know that Wellbutrin was used for ADHD off-label. I would imagine it has to be off-label because there are so few ADHD medications actually prescribed. Oh, Zyban for nicotine cessation. Another thing I did not know. Thank you, that's interesting. Um, right, so just to be clear, I, I don't remember, we haven't gone over the difference between psychotic and mood disorders yet. Um, but just as a preliminary distinction between those, a psychotic disorder would, for instance, uh, schizophrenia is probably the most quintessential psychotic disorder, right? Um, however, and, and schizophrenia or psychosis and schizophrenia is characterized as a lack of lucidity about sense of self and environment. Um, something like bipolar disorder, though, which is a mood disorder, does not necessarily include psychotic elements of it. Um, bipolar disorder, bipolar one, is characterized predominantly by having a manic episode, an episode of prolonged feelings of grandeur and capability, maybe increased activity, decreased need for sleep, increased socialization, making a lot of plans very rapidly, sometimes getting a little bit aggressive about it. Um, and bipolar can include psychosis. Um, bipolar with psychotic elements, but it doesn't always include psychosis. So remember, if you're talking to someone who is just like going and going and going and you're like, hey man, when was the last time you got a full night of sleep? And he's like, oh, three or four days ago, I've really been up. I just like haven't been able to calm down. Um, then that might be more of an indicator of some kind of mania and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a loss of lucidity on the scale that would be required for psychosis to be present. So there is a degree of loss of lucidity with mania because often people that are manic don't necessarily really know that they're manic or they have an idea of it, but aren't fully aware of it. Um, but with psychosis, often there will be like a very low degree of awareness of being not present. Um, okay, so generally antipsychotics are like the two that we're gonna talk about here. There are plenty of things that antipsychotics are prescribed for outside of this would be schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. 
Um, schizotypal disorder, schizoaffective disorder are all different kind of like psychotic disorders that fall under this umbrella. We're just going to talk about the two main ones because it's easier. And antipsychotics are predominantly, typical antipsychotics predominantly act on dopamine. Now, this might come as a bit of a surprise to some of you who are familiar with the interactions that we're going to go over in a minute. Um, yeah, a lot of psychiatric medications, as you said, O'Ryan, are used to um, treat a lot of different things. So just because this is the main use as prescribed, that does not mean that that's what this is limited to. You know, like a lot of people with different psychiatric disorders have been prescribed antipsychotics for different reasons. Some of it depends on what other medications you're on, if you have a certain set of symptoms, if you have comorbid disorders, which means multiple, um, all of these things will influence what you're prescribed. So since they work on dopamine, remember dopamine is largely responsible for regulating motor control and reward. Um, this issue of motor control is really important here because some of the side effects of anti antipsychotics over time can be things like shakiness, um, tardive dyskinesia. Oh my God, I hope I said that right. <laughs> so that can be um, represented by like a tremor, involuntary motion, spasming. And um, in a lot of people, weight gain is pretty common. Um, but there's also the issue of just like general sleepiness, your seizure threshold being significantly lowered, sexual dysfunction. But this issue of, um, of shakiness is one that's really important because antipsychotics can, in some cases, actually induce um, Parkinsonian symptoms. Remember, Parkinson's disease is uh, largely predicated upon an, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, imbalance is too, it feels kind of hand wavy, but the dopaminergic system isn't working quite right in, in Parkinson's disease. There's not enough dopamine activity happening in Parkinson's disease. Um, so there isn't enough, or wait, is it the opposite? Mm. No, it's the opposite. No, it's that way. Yeah. <laughs> so Parkinson's disease, um, this lack of motor control is caused by a lack of dopaminergic regulation. So it's unsurprising that something that acts on dopamine like this could cause Parkinsonian symptoms, right? And that's a major reason why people don't like taking antipsychotics for a long time is because of these neuromuscular side effects. There are just like things happening that are out of your immediate control that can be uncomfortable. So uh, examples of typical antipsychotics would be dopamine antagonists. They antagonize dopamine. They make dopamine do less basically. Um, and atypical antipsychotics often, not always, atypical is a pretty broad category, will be antagonists at both dopamine and serotonin. So you can immediately kind of tell here that we're getting into pretty gnarly interaction territory with antipsychotics. Um, part of the reason that people would choose typical over atypical antipsychotics is because you can gain a significant amount of weight on uh, atypical antipsychotics, but you won't, might not have as many of the neuromuscular side effects because this action is more distributed to the serotonergic system as well. Um, but then there's also the issue of um, libido loss. Like all of these things are just factors that kind of are, are in play when you're deciding which kind of antipsychotic to take. Now, an example that is kind of outside of both of these scopes is lithium. And lithium is a really important one to understand um, I don't fully understand lithium's mechanism of action. I'm not an expert on lithium by any stretch of the imagination or psychiatric medications. You know, I have a cursory understanding of psychiatric medications. Um, and when it comes to lithium though, lithium is really big boy in terms of interactions. Lithium does not fully classify to my knowledge as either atypical or typical antipsychotic because it is um, an anti-manic medication. So it has a different application. It's often used for bipolar as opposed to schizophrenia because it is better at quelling mania, but that interaction um, can be quite serious. I'm gonna talk about it as part of this. Um, are they antagonists or competitive binding? It's, it's variable. It's variable. Um, generally speaking, the activity of dopamine is decreased or with atypical, the activity of dopamine and serotonin is decreased. That's the gist of it is you want less of that to happen. Now, part of this is because our working understanding of schizophrenia could be that there's an excess of dopaminergic activity involved in psychosis, potentially. You know, all of these things we're still, we're like, oh, we have such a good understanding after a hundred years of medicine. And we actually just like, don't know all that much about how these disorders arise. Um, 
in in the case of um, of schizophrenia, though, that's part of the reason why we might see a decrease in symptoms. Uh, following administration of a dopamine antagonist or a dopamine inhibitor of some kind. So antipsychotics, both kinds, lower your seizure threshold, sometimes permanently. That's a big deal. That means that the amount of excess activity in your brain required to cause you to seize, the, the bar is lower and lower, basically. Now, that makes them particularly risky to combine with SSRIs for that reason. And um, kind of on that note, MDMA as well, like mixing Molly with either of these, it poses a probably significantly higher risk of seizure. Um, especially if you're mixing with atypical, the interaction between a serotonin, a serotonin antagonist and a serotonin releasing agent gets kind of confusing and sticky. To my knowledge, there isn't a lot of data on what exactly that looks like, but just like forming a logical hypothesis, that is a, probably a pretty splatty interaction that I would definitely advise staying away from. Um, in the case of psychedelics, lithium, again, which is an anti-manic medication, not necessarily an antipsychotic, traditionally speaking, um, lithium is a big one here. A lot of people are on lithium. It's not like the most common medication. However, it is a significant enough risk that I'm going to mention it on its own here. Combining lithium and classical psychedelics almost always seems to lead to a really negative experience that often has pretty serious psychiatric consequences. I don't understand the mechanism for this. I don't know why that happens. The mechanism of action for lithium is really intense. It's all over the map. It's kind of crazy. Um, so keep that in mind. And this often actually ends up inducing a fugue state, a state of dissociation where someone does not have any kind of attachment to their entire past identity and sense of self, um, which can be really frightening. There's actually a Reddit post that I came across a while ago about um, where someone was like, just combine lithium with LSD, I'll report back. And people in the comments are like, no, wait. And then he reports back and is like, too late guys, I already took it, have a trip sitter here and another person who's just on LSD and is like not on lithium. And then he says another comment a few minutes later that's like, okay, you don't have to keep scaring me. I get it, I shouldn't have done it. And then the next comment is just a bunch of gibberish and then, hey, hey. And then the next comment is, guys, I went to the hospital, but I'm okay now. <laughs> so that's not uncommon. Um, tell your friends who are on medication for mania or psychosis to be aware of this especially because for some people doing psychedelics, if you have a manic disorder or a mood disorder, sorry, a psychotic disorder or a mood disorder is no big deal or can alleviate symptoms sometimes for people with bipolar disorder, maybe. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, I would say generally, if you're predisposed to mania or psychosis, there could be a risk of those things being exacerbated by taking psychedelics from a psychological standpoint. Um, lots of connections being made, areas of the brain are communicating with each other that wouldn't normally, and that can lead to conclusions being drawn, meaning being implanted. Um, basically, if you're at risk, then I would advise being super careful, especially if you're genetically predisposed. Um, and then there's grapefruit. Grapefruit, again, is an enzyme inhibitor, which means that it prevents the breakdown of these drugs in your liver. So that's important. Anything that has an enzyme um, breakdown process, enzymatic breakdown in the liver, if something prevents that liver enzyme from doing its job, there's going to be more of that drug, and you are at risk of having a, a serious set of side effects from there being basically too much of that drug, or it's not getting excreted from your system. You're high for too long. You're too high for too long. So it depends on the drug. But remember, if you're on that drugs wiki page, which is a good jumping off point, but don't take Wikipedia as gospel. There's a reason that you weren't allowed to cite it in elementary school if you are Gen Z like I am, because yes, we had Wikipedia in elementary school. Um, please be aware of where to look for that. Look under the pharmacology, look under the pharmacokinetics, and then look for the enzyme metabolic pathway. If you see the, the letters CYP, SIP, then that's a good indicator that there is an enzyme that's going to break it down or that it prevents the action of. And you should take note of that when you're thinking about combining, even with something like an antihistamine, like you want to be really comprehensive before mixing. 
Um, and alcohol, you know, mixing alcohol with almost anything is not a great idea, <laughs> to be honest. Alcohol is like kind of a globally risky mixture. All right, now taking a look at benzos, benzodiazepines. So benzos are anti-convulsant medications. This means that they suppress convulsant activity. They are used to suppress excessive brain signaling, which can lead to panic attacks or anxiety or um, seizures in some people. So usually benzos are gonna be prescribed for an anxiety disorder or a panic disorder. They're also prescribed off-label for insomnia, which I have beef with. Um, anxiety is commonly treated with benzos, which are GABAergic, right? They increase the effectiveness and the effects of GABA in the brain, similar to alcohol, but with their own unique effects profile. So this is going to be very sedating, make you very sleepy. It's not uncommon to get barred out and to just like pass out. Um, people often feel like they literally can't feel their anxiety or they don't really care about their anxiety. Um, However, benzos are notorious for a reason. And I have a lot to say on benzos. It's one of the few classes of drugs that I will state opinions on. Is that true? Do I say, I feel like I actually state a lot of opinions. I claim that I don't. Um, but benzos are really tricky because on the one hand, they can be incredibly important and life-changing for many people. Um, many people have no problem with them. The beef that I have with benzos is that there is totally insufficient provider warning about the fact that benzos are serious shit and that blackouts, especially at recreational doses of benzos, are pretty common. And that if you're doing recreational benzos that you've purchased illicitly, not from a pharmacist, the likelihood of them actually containing what you think they do is extremely low right now. There are so many benzo analogs, so many of them. Um, one of the most recent posts that we made through Dance Safe was about two novel benzos that have been around for a little bit, but they've been increasing in popularity recently. Clonazolam and, oh no, flubromazolam. <laughs> think, which really sounds like something out of the live action Cat in the Hat movie. You know what I mean? The Cupcake and Ata. We watched that recently. It's just as bad as you remember. If you're unfortunate enough to remember it, it's, it's just as bad. Um, yeah, so the, the benzo market, the illicit benzo market right now is like mostly analogs, to be honest. If you have a bar, then the likelihood of it actually containing alprazolam is pretty low right now if you're buying it anywhere from but a pharmacist. It just makes sense, you know, like why would someone go through the effort of acquiring the precursors which are tightly regulated for a tightly regulated substance when they could just use a benzo analog that has really similar effects and possibly a similar toxicity profile, like who knows? Um, so it makes sense that the market is what it is right now. The issue with some of the novel benzos that we're seeing is that they are very long lasting and very potent per dose. So for instance, um, flu <laughs> flubromazolam <laughs> is um, I believe active at around 50 micrograms. That's half a tab of acid. That's a really, really small amount. That's 1 20th of a grain of sand basically, really tiny. And since these are getting pressed in illicit facilities, the likelihood of it being a perfectly dosed bar, I would say is fairly low. This being said, it's pretty common right now to see reports of people purchasing illicit market benzos, not being able to dose them adequately or correctly because they don't actually know what they're getting or having a completely different product than they bargained for. This is more than they bargain for. And then they're high for like 12 hours. And people are, are writing up posts being like, I blacked out and there are a bunch of boxes outside my door now. Or I blacked out and I drove my car. And that's super dangerous. I don't know if I need to say that, but it's super dangerous to drive your vehicle when you're blacked out on anything. Please don't get behind the wheel of a vehicle. You could kill so many people so fast. So all of those things make it really important to be super mindful when you're buying 
from the illicit benzo market. Now, I know that I haven't actually gone over what they do in case you're not super familiar. So um, basically, like I said, GABA agonists, similar effects to alcohol from a pharmacological standpoint, from a neurological standpoint. Um, however, benzos tend to be quite a bit better tolerated in your body than alcohol is. Alcohol, your body kind of hates it for good reason. It gets broken down into something that's toxic, you know? So this GABA agonism, uh, what's the danger with these analogs? Basically, super potent, super long lasting. You don't know what you're getting. You can't dose it correctly. It may or may not be distributed correctly through your pill. Like it's a lack of informed consent. If you want to take a super high potency benzo, great, go for it. But you should know what it is. Otherwise, you could be at risk of really serious side effects without actually having any way of consenting to them. Now, the thing about benzos is that they're often prescribed off-label for insomnia, but there have been studies indicating that after three to 14 days, benzos aren't actually sleep promoting anymore after three to 14 days of continual use. In addition to this, there isn't very much evidence of continued anxiolytic effects, which means anxiety reducing effects after four months of consistent use. That's a big deal because some people are prescribed benzos for years and years. Now, there have also been some recent studies that have shown kind of that SSRIs and benzos tend to have similar rates of efficacy for treating anxiety. And while benzos can totally be pretty well tolerated when used occasionally or used for short periods of time, using benzos for like months and months and months was never supposed to happen. Like that's a prescriber negligence issue. That's the shit that I have beef with, you know what I mean? When we're looking at the relative harms chart here, benzos fall approximately smack in the middle with a lot of it pertaining to drug-specific impairment and mental functioning and dependence. And this is one that we're really gonna get into the meat of because dependence and benzos is a different kind of animal. Um, benzo dependence, actually we'll get to that in a second. So some major types of benzos include probably everyone's most well-known is Xanax, Xanibars, Alprazolam, Zans, whatever, <laughs> I'm so hip, uh, Clonopin, Clonazepam, Valium, Diazepam, Ativan, Lorazepam, at least they're consistent, right? Ambien, <laughs> just kidding, Zolpidem, I'm not as familiar with Ambien. Um, ignore that, this, this, I really only have this in here because it has the major benzos. Um, it's from an addiction center website, which is not a source that you should get any of your information about drugs ever, like ever. They're never reliable. They're always biased and poorly sort of cited, cited. Now, let's get into this, this thing that a lot of people do not have in their toolkit when they're approaching benzos. Benzos have been involved in a lot of complication deaths, but the phrase complication deaths is important here. Benzos by themselves actually have a really high dose for lethality. Overdosing on just benzos is pretty uncommon. However, a really high percentage of people that do benzos do other drugs at the same time, um, be that smoking weed or opioids of some sort or some other kind of downer like alcohol. Mixing benzos is where you really start to get into trouble. And that's not to say that you can't get into trouble from the blackout and amnesia component of just taking a straight benzo, um, which again, you know, if you're like a, taking a prescribed dose or if you're taking a dose that you know is okay for your body weight of a drug that you know what the contents of are, then that's different than if you're taking an illicit market benzo and it's actually just like a totally unknown dose with an unknown duration. Like these are different circumstances we're talking about here. Unfortunately, a lot of illicit benzo use in this country is from the illicit market. So like they are one and the same for all intents and purposes. And we're additionally seeing a lot of fentanyl contamination in bars. This is super common right now, as well as in cocaine. We're seeing a lot of fentanyl presence in substances like Coke and benzos. Now in Coke, it doesn't make sense, right? Like why would someone cut Coke with fentanyl? Because fentanyl's a downer, Coke is an upper. It's pretty simple. Like the argument that like they want to hook their clients, it's like, yeah, like who's going to do a line of Coke and OD on fentanyl and be like, that was awesome. I was totally expecting to be super, super knotted out. Not how that works. So most likely that is a result of cross-contamination from surfaces. If you have a packing facility that is 
packaging both cocaine and opioids, it's not super out of the question for a little bit of something to get into a little bit of something else. For a baggie to be on a surface that was contaminated with fentanyl, et cetera. For someone's hands, like, I don't know, you can't, you can't OD on fentanyl through your skin. There's a reason that patches are patented as a means of administrating uh, fentanyl. Otherwise, everyone would just like, it'd be super easy. So when it comes to bars, on the other hand, there is speculation that it is possible that there is intentional adulteration of bars or other benzos with fentanyl. And the reason is that fentanyl is a depressant. Bars are also a depressant. Like there is some potential for enhancement of effects there. I don't know how likely it is though. I feel like a lot of it would be contamination. So um, looking at the psychological component of things here, benzos tend to have a fairly high rewarding reinforcing profile. And what that means is that it feels good to do them and you get something out of doing them. So uh, it feels good to do them and your anxiety decreases or you fall asleep, whatever. Like it's a combination of being pleasurable, but also like there's an end result that is nice. And that makes it so that benzos can be pretty appealing for some kinds of people. Um, it's not everyone. That's the case with all drugs. Like not everyone is gonna do benzos and be like, oh my God, I could do this every day and it would be awesome. Some people are like, oh my God, I've never been this not anxious before. This is the best ever. I would like to be this way all the time. And it really depends. So no blanket statements being made here. However, as far as different substances go, um, the fact that benzos have the ability to reduce a symptom that is so chronically plaguing for so many people increases the potential rewarding and reinforcing effects of them. Kind of similar to opioids, you know, like opioids, they're pain relieving. They also have an anxiolytic effect, which means they reduce anxiety. It makes sense that these are like some of the worst parts of the human condition. So if it feels good and it gets rid of those things, then yeah, I mean, like your brain's going to like that a lot. Um, there isn't as much of a component of discomfort to these experiences that is pretty common on other substances. You know, like there's often a, a feeling of discomfort that comes from them that makes them slightly less rewarding or reinforcing feeling. So again, dependent on person to person, but yes, it is true that benzos do have this kind of baseline level of appeal to them in terms of um, regulating dysregulated systems. Um, in terms of uh, dependence, dependence and benzos is a really big deal. Uh, many people have reported that kicking benzo habits after a long time is a lot more difficult than kicking opioid habits. The withdrawals from benzos are a different breed and we'll get to that more in a second. I just wanna circle back real quick to this thing here where I have psychological dependence versus physical dependence. And I would say that benzos are probably one of the best categories to talk about this distinction in. I know I've touched on it before and I've been like complicated, we'll come back to it. So let's come back to it. The difference between physical and psychological dependence, not addiction, dependence. Dependence inherently means when you remove the thing, something unwanted returns. Your body does something in response to the absence of the thing. This doesn't necessarily have to do with craving it, right? Doesn't mean that your brain is like, oh, I want this. It means that your body is reacting to the absence of something. When it comes to physical dependence, this is pretty easy to understand. You withdraw, you have the physical withdrawal symptoms. When it comes to psychological dependence, this confuses people, but think of it this way. When it comes to benzos, they're often prescribed as an anti-anxiety medication, which means that you're probably going to go into your benzo experience having a lot of anxiety built up. You're gonna have an anxiety disorder or panic disorder or something, oftentimes. Psychological dependence means that when you remove the presence of benzos, those unwanted things that you were previously getting rid of return in full force, which means that you can have very severely increased prevalence of anxiety, of panic attacks, et cetera, really bad insomnia after you stop taking a benzo, even if you're not craving it. That's the psychological dependence component. Does anyone have questions on the distinction between physical, psychological addiction? Cool. 
yeah, weird stories about Ambien. <laughs> I've seen a couple of those. Um, mm, I will look at r slash Ambien. Thank you, Jared. Here's just like a, a word of caution. Even when you're taking benzos as prescribed by a physician, if you're taking them consistently for weeks or more, you are at risk of physical dependence. Even if you're not at risk of psychological dependence or addiction, it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed necessarily, but benzos do have a very particular kind of activity, neurologically speaking. It is not uncommon for people to experience withdrawals after taking benzos for as little as three weeks on a daily basis. So just be mindful of that. I think a lot of people really underestimate this um, and can get really, really shocked by this happening. Now, I think I might've mentioned this at some point in the past. There are really two major drugs that can cause classes of drugs that can cause fatal withdrawals, alcohol and benzos. And benzo is a, a kind of broader category. But the reason for this is that you've had this spring of activity in your brain and you've increased your GABA functionality in your brain. You're pushing down on that spring being like, shh. So when you reduce the amount of pressure on that spring or if you lift it off entirely, the spring bounces back. Now this means that there's often a flood of activity in the brain, a lot of signaling happening from signals that had previously kind of built up under the pressure to be like, mm, we need to get this through. and once that happens, you're at pretty high risk of seizures, which can lead to coma, cardiac arrest, et cetera. Um, and also just like other cardiac complications associated with like suddenly having there be so much activity going on. Now, most people will go through the worst parts of most withdrawals in about two weeks. After that two week period, a lot of it is psychological but benzos can be different. And this is why I have such a caution for people that use benzos frequently recreationally or otherwise, is that benzo withdrawal can last for years. And precipitated withdrawal from benzos, which means drawn out withdrawal from benzos, is unusual because some days it can be fully on and some days it's off. And people often report feeling as though they have no idea which day they're going to be debilitated from it and which day they're going to be totally fine. And that's really hard when you're trying to live your daily life. A lot of people completely discredit precipitated benzo withdrawal. A lot of prescribers have never even heard of it before. So if someone comes to you and they're like, man, I've just been feeling like fluey and terrible off and on for months. If they mention that they've discontinued benzo use or if they've been like, my doctor doesn't believe me, believe them. This is a really big deal. A lot of people are really deeply stigmatized for this and shamed for not being able to handle their lives basically as a product of this. There are a lot of support groups for people going through very long-term benzo withdrawal. In many cases, this is actually in older people that have been prescribed it for insomnia or anxiety and just like didn't know. Uh, how does one identify heart palpitations? So heart palpitations kind of feel like your heart is beating, beating, and then all of a sudden it just kind of like in your chest. Like it doesn't feel like it correctly completed its beat or like it's beating irregularly occasionally. That's an arrhythmia. Um, palpitations can come in many forms. Basically, if, if you feel like you can, you can physically feel it when it happens. I get heart palpitations sometimes. That's how I know this. Um, you can kind of like a, C, a CD skipping. Uh, I guess it, maybe a little bit. It feels a little more fluttery than that to me personally, at least. It feels a little bit kind of like I often literally go like this when it happens because it feels like my heart just like skips an entire beat. And I'm like, hello, <laughs> you need to be doing that constantly, please. That's my understanding of it, at least. Um, oh, God. Guys, I got an iPhone. It's exciting. So cross tolerance can occur from benzos and alcohol. And that means that one of them will increase your tolerance to another and Again, mixing benzos and alcohol, super, super life-threateningly dangerous because you are collectively increasing the activity of GABA, which is collectively decreasing the activity of your breathing, of your heart rate, and generally of your systemic 
functionality. This mixture can kill people. And it's really, really common, especially among younger generations in the Bay Area, to combine um, benzos and alcohol. This is super serious. If you know anyone that is considering mixing benzos, opioids, alcohol in any permutation or combination, that is a life-threatening thing that they are doing. So super major harm reduction thing to know. Um, we're actually gonna kind of ignore this. This is from like seven years ago, but generally uh, there were a lot of people, especially older groups that went to emergency rooms for benzo-related complications. There is a huge culture around benzo use, like benzo use has been glamorized and um, what's the word for when it's normalized as a, like a constant recreational thing by so many major figures, particularly in hip hop um, and rap. I'm trying to think of what other genre is really big on benzos, but literally stuff like this, like jerseys for Xanax, Adderall, and Vicodin, you know, like very, very caricaturized almost. And people genuinely have no idea. It's kind of similar to lean culture of how people genuinely don't realize that lean is an opioid and that you can become physically dependent on it and withdraw from it. <laughs> like people have no idea. So um, I'm keeping an eye on this. I hope that you are as well. You know, we have literally Lil Xan, <laughs> like, is so popularized, so popularized. Now to take a look finally at addiction. Now, according to NIDA, which is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is not my favorite resource for so many reasons, I in fact will pretty much never pull information from there unless it's like graphs that's just purely based off of like quantitative data from emergency rooms, whatever. Um, but they define addiction as being a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. And this is the major key phrase here is despite harmful consequences. Now, this is uh, American studies, addiction medicine, American studies, America, oh my God. <laughs> what does the S stand for? American Society of Addiction Medicine. They do addiction medicine there in America. According to these guys, uh, this is, I don't bother to remember the names of people whose uh, politics around drugs I consider to be questionable, just to be clear as to why I don't know the acronyms of these things that I'm reading right now. So according to ASAM, um, addiction is an ability to consist, inability, inability to consistently abstain from using drugs or seeking the stimulus, impairment of behavioral control, diminished recognition, uh, recognition of problems with one's behavior and interpersonal relationships and a dysfunctional emotional response. I think that this definition is quite a bit more comprehensive than this one personally, but that's just me. Now, when we're looking at addiction as considered to be a disorder of the brain's pathways, and I'll come back to why this isn't the whole story in a second, we need to look at, the, like I said before, is it rewarding and reinforcing? Rewarding it feels good. Like you feel like you accomplished something. You got something out of it. It was a success. It feels like success. And reinforcing is like, I would do this again for one reason or another. Those are the two R words that go into what is typically defined as being addiction. Now, the thing about this is that's the disease model of addiction. It basically says if you're chronically exposed to this stimulus, this thing, that has an addictive property to it, then your brain chemistry will change over time in response to it to be super sensitized to that thing. That's the addiction model, the disease model of addiction. And that's all well and good because that does happen. You know, we do see changes in brain structure in response to chronic exposure to addictive stimuli, be that substances or sex or gambling or anything that is rewarding and reinforcing. It can really be like so many things like porn, for instance. But it's just not that simple. And recognizing that it's not that simple is super important because I've mentioned this before. If we look at addiction as being exclusively, oh, my brain chemistry has been permanently altered because of this thing. I cannot help what's happening right now because my brain chemistry is altered. Like on the one hand, it is true that once your brain chemistry is altered, you cannot just like snap your fingers and have that be over. On the other hand, 
that can often be used as a means of basically instilling learned helplessness, but like on a systemic level and people be being like, you have no control over anything. And this can make people feel really weak and really helpless and really stuck. So on the one hand, it's important to recognize like, yeah, people are struggling really fucking hard. If your brain chemistry is against you, any of you here who have a diagnosis of any kind will know that if your brain chemistry is against you, it's really goddamn difficult to get anything done, like way harder than you might expect and can be really hard to empathize with. Like fingers up, if you've ever been diagnosed with something that people have not been able to understand as being, like you don't actually have to put your fingers up, but respect if you do. If, if you've been diagnosed with something where people have invalidated the fact that it could actually have real influence over your behaviors on a subconscious and involuntary level, like it sucks when people are invalidating like that. It sucks when socially you are invalidated like that. That's just for psychological, like more um, traditionally psychological disorders like depression or OCD or anxiety or whatever. But when it comes to addiction, people are either put in, in the camp of you brought this fully upon yourself. It's 100% your responsibility and your fault. You are weak. There is something wrong with you. You could have done something about this and you didn't. Or the camp of you are completely out of control of your own actions and you need to surrender to a higher power. Do either of these work independently? For some people, I guess, like outliers, sure. That's why I ha have problems with the lack of availability of anything except 12-step programs that basically say you need to be abstinent from all drugs and you are completely helpless. Um, but there is a middle ground to be reached here, which is basically the psychosocial model of addiction. And this means that there are many things that contribute to whether or not you are vulnerable to this change in neuro neurological pathways and that contribute to whether or not you are prepared with resources to actually do something about those neurological pathways. Like the level of susceptibility a person has to addiction as we recognize it is largely dependent on their environment, but also dependent on genetics. So we can't look at this as just a like, okay, this person is here. They have this relationship with this thing period, that's it, like, what are they gonna do about it now? You have to look at the history and you have to look at what is going on in this person's life and mind outside of whatever the problem is. That might sound obvious to you, but apparently it's not obvious to the vast majority of people because all anyone ever wants to talk about is the drug involved. There's rarely any conversation being like, how was your life growing up? Did you have stable housing? And these are the major contributors that determine whether a person is predisposed to addiction and also how well they can handle problematic substance use or relationships with a problematic stimulus when it arises. Your community is a major part of this. Many of you have heard of Rat Park, and I know that Rat Park is controversial. It basically was one rat bottle of water, bottle of cocaine, bottle of heroin, and the rats would often just like gorge themselves to death on the drugs if they were alone in a cage and die. But if you put that same rat in this like rat paradise and there were lots of other rats and stimulation, none of the rats died. Now there's a lot of scrutiny for that study. It's hard to replicate. However, Portugal's done a really good job of replicating that study in vivo with actual humans. Portugal's rate of overdose deaths went down by I think 50% after they decriminalized all drugs and diverted, not just decriminalized drugs, diverted the money that they were spending on prevention and law enforcement to programs that would basically pay half of the salary for people that were getting reintroduced into the workforce so that they had incentive to be hired. Like that is Rat Park in real life. That is looking at the real re reasons for this. So having a social connection and network, having things to bond with, if you are not able to bond with your environment and seek pleasure and expansion and actualization from your environment, then of course, you're gonna look for what is rewarding. Your brain will seek out what provides you with a sense of comfort and stability and euphoria and like a journey, you know? Like it's natural that that would be the case.
And then there are finances. Something that people do not take into consideration is the fact that poverty is a major, major stressor on mental health, on physical health, on your ability to find stable housing, which again, housing is a major, major stressor. Even if it's just like you live in a mansion with a bunch of really abusive, shitty housemates, you're going to suffer. If you're suffering, what will you bond with? Now, this question of bonding is an interesting one and doesn't necessarily have a huge body of science behind it, but it's just an encapsulation of this subject as a whole. This concept that it is not as simple as the individual. This is a holistic thing. It is a psychosocial model. Let's take a look at this pharmacologically. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the reward system. The reward system refers to a group of structures that are activated whenever we experience something rewarding, like using an addictive drug. When exposed to a rewarding stimulus, the brain responds by increasing release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Thus, structures that are considered part of the reward system are found along the major dopamine pathways in the brain. The pathway most often associated with reward is the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which starts in an area of the brain stem called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. The VTA is one of the principal dopamine producing areas in the brain, and the mesolimbic dopamine pathway connects it with the nucleus accumbens, a nucleus found in a part of the brain that is strongly associated with motivation and reward. That's called a big dopamine striatum. area. When we use an addictive drug or experience something rewarding, dopamine neurons in the VTA are activated. These neurons project to the nucleus accumbens via the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, and their activation causes dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens to rise. Another major dopamine pathway, the mesocortical pathway, also originates in the VTA, but travels. Okay, this is maybe a little bit advanced for what we're doing right now. If you're curious, you can look back in the lecture if you want to know more of the actual neuroscience behind Welcome it. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience. Ah! Now, oh my God, I'm looking at the chat. One drink equals three. Woo, wow. Yeah, that's real. Um, a frat at the college that I left at, that apparently got quaaludes shipped from South Africa so they could spend less on alcohol. Wow. I have a taco addiction. I'm sorry to hear that. Sounds, oh no, I was gonna say sounds corny because of corn tortilla, but I realized in the process of saying the word that it was gonna be a really terrible joke. Uh, yeah, it is very much like nature versus nurture. And as with nature versus nurture, shockingly, it's both. It's both of those things, which we'll come back to in a second. Now, here's some funky shit, and this is kind of an out of left field, like this, you just shouldn't internalize this as the be all and end all of addiction. This is just an interesting biological thing that I think is cool. So you have this protein in your brain that causes changes in the genes related to neuron growth and reward. So it changes the way that your brain decides when and how and where to build new neurons, basically. So when you have an excess of delta FOS B, which can happen from certain drugs causing delta FOS B to become overexpressed, this basically means that you are expressing an increased stimulate, you're, you're stimulating your brain to produce dopamine neurons in response to certain things, in response to certain ways. So for instance, here is your dopamine neuron, and then here is um, after a while, you basically have these genetic changes in how your proteins decide what to make dopamine neurons responsive to. Basically, in a nutshell, this means that the theory is that there's a potential link between certain substances that cause an increased expression of this protein, more of this protein, and making that protein say, okay, we're going to grow new neurons that really like this thing. Basically, this thing causes the protein to be expressed and therefore the protein is like, oh, that, yeah, we like that. Which means that there might be areas of the brain that are more densely populated with dopamine neurons that really like a specific thing. They're really responsive, very sensitive to a specific thing. Now, again, this is not like a broad explanation of like, oh, this is what addiction is. But this is just one example of how this might be seen on a neurobiological basis is basically an increased sensitivity of dopamine neurons to a certain stimulus. Brain likey, much more. Brain identify thing and say, oh, this is excellent. It makes me release dopamine. In case you are curious, let's hear firsthand 
what someone says addiction feels like. Try and think about not eating. Your brain's trained in the knowledge that it needs fuel to, to keep your body alive. Um, and also you're in the routine of eating at certain times in the day. If you were to think about not eating, you know, you're really trying to break a cycle of habit and dependency, um, which is like trying to not use drugs. And the more you think about not eating, the more your brain will want to eat. The more you think about, I can't eat, the hungrier you get and you think further that I just really want to eat. And the more it gets on the brain, you know, that you would not eating feel tired and weak. And you'll be thinking, if I just went down the shop and got some food, if I just went to the kitchen cupboards and got some food, I wouldn't feel like this way anymore. That's what addiction feels like. You're programmed to require something and you need that. So something that a lot of people compare the experience of addiction to is it's a compulsive behavior. Like addiction is compulsive use. Um, but a lot of people refer to it as kind of similar to the process of being in a toxic relationship. Now for this one, I'm going to pull open all of the gallery of the current attendees. And I want everyone to show me a thumbs up. If you have ever been in a relationship that you knew was probably not amazing for you, but that you had such a good time in, or you felt so good in that you didn't end. And your friends are probably like, why are you still doing this? Like, this is obviously a codependent relationship. This is obviously a toxic relationship. Like clearly there is some dysfunction happening here, but still you were like, I know I get it, but I just like, I really love this person. Like, I know that it's not like the best, but I really care about them. That is a very similar neurological experience to the experience of addiction. And that's something that I think um, is poorly factored in when people consider the empathy that they have towards people that use drugs, towards people that have problematic relationships with drugs. It's often not that simple. You know, like if you are a person who has ever been in a relationship that you and everyone around you knew deep down was really fucking rewarding and awesome and fun and like felt so good to be a part of and the thought of not having that person in your life anymore is like mind boggling and and breaks the laws of reality if you've ever had an experience like that and you have shit talked someone for experiencing addiction then take a hard look because they're really not that different in terms of how your brain chemistry responds. Um, does this suggest that hypothetically an ADHD medication could permanently increase your brain sensitivity to dopamine, thus possibly even diminishing ADHD symptoms after stopping use? I don't know. I think it's possible. That would make sense to me logically. Um, the idea behind a lot of ADHD medications, especially pediatric ADHD medications, is that amphetamine has actually been shown in the past to reduce um, ADHD symptoms in kids through their adolescence very effectively and reliably. So kind of similarly to our, our theory about how SSRIs basically make your brain have its own natural antidepressant effect by reducing transporter production, it could be a kind of a similar mechanism there. I don't actually know for sure. I would have to look. Breaking up and PCP withdrawal have the exact same chemical reactions. You know, I actually think that I remember that oxytocin is a part of, um, of many kinds of drug use as well, but I don't know for, I feel like that's something I read kind of cursory that isn't usually talked about. Uh, yeah, a lot of people view it like a breakup. A lot of people view kicking a substance like a breakup. So going back to nature versus nurture, this is a guesstimate, you know, approximately half of people have addiction vulnerability based on genetic predisposition and another half of people might have that vulnerability due to environmental predisposition. 
And this can mean exposure to substances. This can mean um, dysfunctional emotional states, dysfunctional physical states, dysfunctional housing states, impoverishment, systemic injustices is a really huge one that people do not take into consideration. If the, the basically the more the odds are stacked against you, the more vulnerable you are. And this comes from so many different angles. It's never going to be as simple as like, oh, this person just like should have known better and et cetera. Like in many cases, people did know differently and did it anyway. And in some cases, it's completely a non-issue for them. In other cases, people just like have a different experience altogether. One thing that I think is important to keep in mind that I've said before, if it were the drugs exclusively, if it were as simple as heroin is addictive, you will get addicted to heroin if you do it. Everyone who did heroin would get addicted, period. But that doesn't happen. Inherently, that means that it's not actually the drug. It's all of the factors that make you more or less vulnerable to a problematic relationship with a particular substance. Okay, then drug dependence. We'll just go over this real quick. I guess this will take the whole time. Next time we're doing psychedelic counterculture, which I'm very excited about. Psychedelic history, psychedelic counterculture, kind of getting into the more obscure things like psychedelic fish. Um, so drug dependence is basically withdrawal for, of some kind. It means that your body has become accustomed to this thing, no longer has this thing, you experience physiological or psychological withdrawal. We already went over this, so I won't really go into it too deeply. Basically, this can be split into withdrawal symptoms or tolerance, and tolerance is you need more of it for it to have the same effect. Withdrawal symptoms is the unpleasant effects in its absence, and your body adapts to it. This is just your body adapting. So the overlap here is that addiction ultimately will result in altered brain chemistry where there's a lot of seeking compulsive behavior, um, a lot of like obsessive thinking. And then there's dependence, which is your body or your brain have adapted to it and it will not function correctly without. Okay. Is that everything? Yeah. And we're right on time tonight. Um, yeah, so next time we're going to talk about psychedelic counterculture and cultural history, which I'm very excited about. We're going to start to touch a little bit on some of the funkier, more hidden stuff. So that was the end of the spotlight, specifically on how the stuff works um, generally. And we're going to start now moving into like the histories, the politics, the dirty little secrets, the corners and niches of drugs and get a little bit more specific with what we're talking about. So um, I've been kind of not super active on Discord recently because it's been kind of a mess over here, um, but I will try to respond to everything as soon as I can. And other than that, feel free to reach out and nudge me, just always nudge me if I'm not responding. And I will see you guys on Thursday.